You're watching Understanding Bigfoot. Why understand Bigfoot? Because we know they're real. Now, let's start Understanding Bigfoot with your host, Mike Scott. Okay, thank you, Sean Seaball, our producer, and Mike Scott with you once again, Understanding Bigfoot. We're coming to you uh, home base, Cape Girardeau, Missouri, southeast Missouri, about 100 miles south of St. Louis on the Mississippi River. Um, another Cape Girardeau native, or not native, but resident, Susan Perez, our director of the local uh, Bigfoot Facebook group, the SEMO Bigfoot Encrypted Research Group, is with us again tonight. And Susan... Um, it's good to see you back with us. And, of course, Becky Pepper uh, comes to us from Nakona, Texas, and is with us quite a bit. And, our guys, our, our guest tonight, uh, Rick Taylor, is also a Texan um, from the um, uh, the DFW area. And Rick has got, got a whole lifetime of stories. We might have to do two programs and, and go one to the other. Ryan. I don't know. Um, but, Rick... Um, Welcome to the program. Uh, we're glad to have you. Ladies, welcome. Thank you much. Welcome. Glad to be here. Thank you. Welcome, Rick. I'm glad to have another Texan on the program. All right. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, Rick, do you know where Nakona is, Nakona, Texas? Yes, I've been through there quite a bit. And a matter of fact, when I was working for Travelers Insurance, uh, I actually investigated that huge fire at oh, the... Uh, yeah, I, I, would, I was lead investigator on that for the insurance company, the big fire that took out the uh, Nakona boot, I believe, or boot, something. Boot, yeah, boots or baseball gloves. One or yeah, bo- baseball gloves too. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, that was anyway, several years ago. That, it's Becky, been a few. You've been in Nakona how long now? Gone on 14 years. I believe that years. fire was um, the summer that we moved here. Because it happened just right before we moved. So, so how old were you when you moved to Nakona? Now you're making me do some math. Let's not. <laughs> well, the reason, not the reason, that, the reason I know that, what you're the, getting the reason at. Was, she, she says she's I been know there what four, you're getting at. Nikki <laughs> says she's been there 14 years. We're recording this on. <laughs> Monday, March the sixth, and by the time this show is released, Becky will have another birthday, and and I just wanted to kind of see if the audience can kind of pick up on that. You didn't take the bait. No, 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 no. Where you're getting that now? We're not going to talk about that one. Oh, you almost fell for it. Almost. I know. Almost did. (laughs) Anyway. before we get into Rick, I want to share uh, with you guys um, and Sean to get this picture up here in just a second. Just in real time, I was out in the field yesterday uh, here in uh, north of Cape Girardeau, where we where we go, and uh, a gentleman who's in the uh, Facebook group just now starting to want to get into researching with us was doing some camping this past weekend, and he wanted. Uh, um, I told him when I had a chance, I'd get up there and, and, and take him out. He's kind of skeptical. He doesn't know about this stuff. He's not sure. He thinks we're all hoaxing it, maybe. But he, I said, well, when I get a chance, I'll go up there and I'll take you out on a hike and I'll show you some footprints and I'll show you some, you know, show you what to look for. And he's, well, I walked all over this place and couldn't find any. I said, that means just, you know. So anyway, I was able to do that yesterday afternoon. And and we did find footprints. I did show him foot multiple size different footprints, you know, probably about four or five different increments. But one thing, there was a glyph right there at the primitive campground that he was at, right there on top of the picnic table, a triangular glyph, rock formations uh, running the perimeter, and then little bitty sticks making a, a perfect triangle, and that was left on the picnic table. And he told us he got there on Friday afternoon. He said, well, that was here. And this was, this was yesterday, which was Sunday. He said, well, that was here when I got here. And this is a very sparsely inhabited area. There's not many people come back through there, especially kids and things like that. So, and as I combed the area of the picnic table, I also found eight to 10 inch footprints kind of walking around there. Um, just, you know, little barefoot eight to 10 inch footprints, uh, which would represent, you know, a juvenile, a younger juvenile 
Sasquatch. And I was explaining to him glyphs, and I explained to him, there's well, there's no way right now that we can prove that Sasquatch did this. But I'm telling you from my research, it's very likely. Well, I got home last night, and I shared that with um, some glyph buddies of ours, uh, Lynn Gasper and, um, and Barb Hartman, who, who we just did the show with on glyphs, um, and Becky. Back shared with Becky as well, and I said, hey, look what I found today. And then Barb sent me a similar structure, and Sean can put this one up now, from Barb Shoop out of the state of Washington, which was a circular rock formation with all the little twigs placed inside that to make a full circle. And I thought it was more confirming for me that you have two very similarly placed glyphs, one in Southeast Missouri, one in the state of Washington by in two separate areas. And, 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 and we're sharing that with each other. And that's, you know, that's one way we learn. And that's the new research for the day before we get into Rick Taylor. So, Susan, Becky, um, maybe a little elaboration on that. We can kind of kind of move on then. What do you well, think, Susan? Well, Don't I remember uh, when we were there, it was last year, the year before, and I found a footprint in some ashes. It was like someone had taken and dumped their um, fire ashes just at the, the side of the camp there, going down into that field. And what was interesting, I cast it. It was definitely a juvenile. It was small. I can't remember the size, but it was that one was about you know, ten inches. Yeah, it, it it was about that. But what was interesting in those ashes was all kinds of broken glass. And I thought if it had been a child, you know, they would have cut their foot. And so because when I did the cast, it picked up all the broken glass, and I had to very carefully extract it out when it hardened. Now, it didn't come out as great as I had anticipated, but that was uh, a juvenile print too. And so that kind of goes along with what you're seeing. Yeah, Mike, I, I was just pretty impressed with what you sent me last night because, I mean, I could tell that it was, it took a lot of talent to, to, to make that, you know? Yeah. And, you know, you could see the twigs in the middle and the formation of the triangle and then the, you know, the rocks or the stones are around the edges. And I just thought, you know, and then it, like how there was one at the top and one at the bottom and it seemed to be symmetrical. And right. it was very interesting because not just, just someone, you know, pretty intelligent too, I think would have to put that yeah. together. Now, and, and, and Barb Shoop is a household name when it comes to Bigfoot uh, researchers. Uh, I remember long before we even thought about this stuff, one of the few things on YouTube I would watch Bigfoot related was the old Barb and Gabby series. Susan, I know you remember the Barb mm -hmm. and Gabby uh, series where she'd take her little dog out and they'd go find all kinds of Bigfoot evidence in the state of Washington. And, and Barb was kind enough through through Barb Hartman to to share that glyph with us and say, yeah, go ahead and use it. And, and you know, she's got her own um, YouTube channel, Barb Shoop, S-H-U-P-E. Uh, look her up on that. She's got some good stuff. She's an excellent, well-known researcher um, up out of the Pacific Northwest. And, and, and when, she, when that got shared and compared the circular rocks with the twigs, it's very similar to what my triangle was. It's almost like a confirmation that that these um, Sasquatches all across the country have similar thought processes, and they're very, as you said, very artistic, very talented with what they're doing. So, Rick right. Taylor uh, is with us. Rick, you have a lifetime of experiences. Have you ever dealt much on the glyph side of it? I know you're more of a face-to-face -face guy, but you know, I've, I've run across things. Uh... <clears throat> different breaks in, in tree structures, you know, X's, uh, asterisk uh, yeah. patterns. Uh, not sure their significance. I think they may be marking that location for a different, you know, maybe it's a birthplace. Uh, you know, who knows? But 
little ones, uh, the ones I've seen, uh, mainly kind of pyramid shaped like a, a crude, well, not really a crude, a little intricate TP framing. Right. You know, where the, where the uh, limbs and twigs and everything are, are fashioned. Interwoven uh, arch structures uh, a lot. And yeah. one of the guys I was out with that's pretty uh, uh, savvy it thinks that they could be markers for the younger ones. Um, we noticed that the, the arch structures were all leaning towards a water source. You know, they were pulled that okay. direction. So, you know, it's it's supposition, but maybe it's a, an arrow for the younger ones uh, where to go for water, you know, or who knows? <laughs> well, a lot of us speculate on that as we, as we study them and see them in different areas and so forth. But... I don't know if any of us really know, but 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 it is it is a fact though that they do create forest art out of the tools of the forest, the sticks, the trees, and and the brush and things of that nature. Because we see it uh, just about everywhere we go, where they're where they are there. So now you mentioned a minute ago we were doing the introductions, Rick, and, and I think this is very important with what we're going to talk about on the on the uh, show. You mentioned your background in investig in investigations through yes sir through insurance through um, um, you know fire and and law enforcement and things along those lines. That's very important because when you're talking about the subject of Bigfoot, Sasquatch, Sabe, whatever they want to call them, Sitonga as they call them up north, but as you talk about that subject, we're going on the evidence that we have and we're going against a governmental stance that, that no such thing exists. And therefore with your background, especially that comes into play because you're a professional at ruling things out and ruling things in. Talk to us a little bit about that background and how you use it in your research. Well, uh, I spent, 20 something years with the city of Houston uh, and uh, actually structural firefighting for four years, uh, paramedic for six, and the last 12 uh, at the rank of captain uh, in the fire marshal's office as an arson investigator. Uh, been to all three uh, academies the fire academy, uh, paramedic school at UT and uh, the uh, law enforcement academy, police academy at uh, Baytown uh, Police uh, Headquarters. Uh, we were a plainclothes investigative law enforcement agency. We worked closely with the FBI, ATF. Uh, I understand evidence, uh, forensics, interviewing, gathering information. That's, that's part of what was in my wheelhouse, but when I retired, uh, in uh, 1996, uh, I then went into the private side uh, for insurance concerns as a private investigator, still certified today at that. I understand uh, forensic uh, gathering of evidence. I understand the importance of an eyewitness. Uh, that was one of the things that sold me, Mike, was when I was debating whether these things existed or not, is I would casually run into folks uh, at different conferences. I was I had the hunger for information just like everybody else. Uh, I uh, knew what happened the night my son and I had a cinder block sized object thrown at us night fishing. <laughs> and going out there the next day and looking at distances, I played uh, ball, uh, softball, uh, some hardball, uh, football when I was much younger. Uh, I understand physical abilities, you know, and yeah, right. looking at the distances, I knew that wasn't humanly possible. And for a while, Mike, I went to all these conferences and things. I was told at one place, uh, you know, no, you're way too close to the DFW metro area. That couldn't have been anything like that. You know, again, the expectation bias or, you know, the prejudicial thinking. 
a lot of what I was, you know, uh, asking folks about kind of got poo-pooed, you know. And at some point I said, wait a second, I know how to conduct my own investigations. And I teamed up with some people and, and really went out and started doing serious research out in the field, not to be disappointed. But uh, I think the most important facet of evidence is the eyewitness and people are the first to poo-poo that. But when you have somebody telling you something that they're going to be ridiculed about, they're not going to receive personal gain or recognition, and they'll look you in the eye and say, I don't care who, who believes me, that's what happened to me. That's pretty, that's pretty heavy. I mean, an eyewitness is at the top of your evidence chain, and yet it's the first to get shot down by people. Absolutely. Uh, and, and Becky can tell you that firsthand. <laughs> yes, I sure can. That's what I was just thinking about. You, you and He's exactly that, right. Yes, you're exactly right, Rick. Yeah. And, you know, with my training, I, I can pretty well, in a, in a set environment, uh, kinesic signs of deception, the sentence structuring, I, I can pretty well tell when somebody's uh, fabricating or they're really going back in their mind's eye and telling me what they experienced. And that was probably the biggest thing that gave me the, 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 the best, biggest hunger uh, for knowledge. And I don't, I, I go with uh, uh, d several different groups, but uh, for the fellowship and for what happens, but I like to go out on my own a lot with, you know, a small group. And I, I've reached a point, folks, where trying to prove this to the skeptics of the world, I don't have that desire anymore. That hunger dropped off a number of years ago. I just share with people that are interested. And if they want to, you know, if they want to believe it, fine. If they don't, but what they believe or accept doesn't change the empirical knowledge that I've gained out there for myself, you know, seeing is believing. <laughs> and that's why our show is called what it is, Understanding Bigfoot, because as far as we're concerned, the, the, the proof exists with the people that have had the experiences. And, and we're not out, you know, you know, we're not out trying to say, well, okay, we, does this help prove this? Or does, you know, some of these uh, Sasquatch podcasts or whatever you want to call them says, okay, this is the next step in trying to prove the existence to me um, and Susan and Becky and you, Rick, it's already proven. You know, it's, it's, our, it's already there. We just, we're just trying in our case to get a better understanding of some of the behaviors. That's why I kind of showed the different glyphs up at the beginning of the program. Now, so with your background, you could probably, you know, you go back to one of our early episodes with Becky where it says, you know, Sasquatch was white. The title was, you know, he was white and her, <laughs> and her sighting. You could watch that program and with your background, you could tell whether or not Becky's telling the truth. And we know she is. Um, and you would, and you would be able to reassure, re reconfirm. Yeah, definitely just by, just by your professional background in that uh, situation. But talk to us a little bit about what got you into the Bigfoot side of things. Maybe it was your first sighting or your first pieces. You had to, you had to have had something going on before you started working with BFRO and all these other outfits. My son and I uh, were night fishing. We had moved up uh, to North Texas uh, after I retired from Houston. And uh, him and I would spend all night fishing. Okay. I remember going to Cooper Lake uh, one time uh, before we had this incident, uh, Mike. I remember being very nervous. Okay. Uh, we stayed out the night there on a pier. But the tree line, something there uh, made me a little nervous. And uh, we slept out there on the pier, but uh, I just remember that. You know, times where, you know, I feel like you're being watched or there's just something not right. Uh, but this particular time we were on uh, uh, a tributary creek to the East Trinity River bottom. And, and, uh, 
I just had my little granddaughter show me her. Okay. <laughs> she came in. And uh, we'd been out there since about 8 o'clock. And uh, it was after midnight, maybe 1 o'clock. Uh, at some point, I began to become aware of movement down the creek bank on our side. Uh, we were on a little apex there, a little side slew ran into the main creek, and I was parked right on that corner. So anything from two different directions would have to cross water. And I, again, you know, I've been out in the, the woods and, and stuff all my life in several different states and thought I knew everything that lived out there, okay? <laughs> but uh, it was after midnight when I got the distinct feeling of being watched. Um, not nervous, but just... I've had that feeling before. Uh, I've had people watching me and they say, how did you know I was there? I said, I felt you. And that could be my grandmother was full blood Cherokee. My grandfather was mixed blood Cherokee. Uh, I'm, I'm very proud of the native blood, but I'm equally proud of the Scots, Irish, Dutch, and German that I have. It's who I am. I can't be anybody but me, you know? So uh, I was sitting there and at some point, uh, this feeling of being watched came over me after I was aware of movement. And uh, somewhere in that increased feeling of being watched, if you take a branch and you break it above the ground and it snaps, it's a different sound than a branch on the ground being stepped on and, and broke. The acoustics are different. And I could hear the sharp but dull snap of, of a, a pretty good sized branch breaking from being crushed beneath weight. And uh, uh, I don't know of anything four legged dog or anything else that would, uh, uh, you know, coyotes, raccoons, night foraging animals that would, uh, could do that, you know? Right. And so that with the feeling of being watched and that snap very close across that little side slew, I got it and I got my, uh, uh, Q-beam spotlight out, and I started spotting that brush line on the other side of the slough, not really expecting to see anything more out of curiosity, wasn't scared, wasn't upset. And as I was panning that bright circle of light, I momentarily caught a facial shape. I'm not talking about a snout and ear, you know, pointed ears and everything, but a, a human-like facial shape recessed back in the brush you know, through the gaps of the leaves and the branches where the light had penetrated. But I was moving that circle of light so fast, I'd already passed it when it registered. And then I snapped the light back and I, I couldn't locate it then. And my son was sitting in a folding chair. He kind of seen me jerk a little and he, you know, looked over there. He's about 20 feet away. He said, Dad, uh, what are you doing? <laughs> And I didn't want to spook, he was 15 at that time. I didn't want to spook him and say, you know, there's somebody over there. You know, I just, in my mind, I'm thinking, what was that? And I told him, oh, I'm just looking. And I put the light back up, got, got back in my folding chair there by the bank. And, but I was aware at that point, right. uh, you know, some, something across that slew over there. And I listened, I was listening and it was not more than 10 minutes, but not less than five. I heard a faint swish you know, kind of rustle of leaves or something. And I glanced over. All I had was a Coleman lantern on my tailgate, but I caught a, a shape rising, arcing out of that, that brush line towards us. And it, it came by in front of us about five feet away and hit the water. And uh, it wasn't like a softball, you know, or a little tennis ball or something. It was like a cinder block size object. It was a kawoosh, uh, like a 50 pound child doing a cannonball off the high dive and scared the daylights out of me. I'm falling back away in my chair, getting splattered by huge drops from the, the splash. And because my, it hit you. It, it was close. It was within five feet of us. If it would have you know? hit you, it would have done some serious damage. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That was my first thing on my mind was this could have broken me up or killed me if it hit me. And I I pulled him back. He had jumped. I mean, my son had dropped his pole and 
latched on to me like a leech yelling, what was that? What was that? And I'm pulling him back and I'm watching these big waves fan out in my mind thinking, what was that? And uh, at that point, uh, I, I felt threatened, Mike. I, I felt really threatened. I thought at the time it was somebody just messing with us. So I jumped up. I raced over to the truck. I got, got my 357 out that I, I keep in the truck. And I yelled out. I said, that's not funny. You know, I've got a gun. If you throw something else, I just may shoot back. And uh, pretty well mad because we weren't trespassing. We weren't uh, harassing. We were minding our own business in a public open area. And it, it just, it angered me. So I wanted to mess back with them, whoever was over there. I got right about where... I, I estimated I saw the, you know, the face and maybe where the object came from. And I cocked my uh, revolver back, single action. I safely pointed it straight down in the mud in front of me. And I shot off around, you know, and pretty loud, you know, if you don't, if you've never, you know, heard of 357, it's, it's a loud gun. And when it went off, on the other side there of that brush, it sounded like I had jumped a moose, a big elk, or a big buck deer, or a horse, and it shot off directly away from us like a baby bulldozer, crashing limbs, crushing bushes, and just plowing through that heavy vegetation away from us at a high rate of speed. And we sat there listening to it till it faded out. I estimate a couple hundred yards. Yeah, and then I turned to my son with my jaw <laughs> open, and he had his jaw open looking at me. He goes, Dad, what was that? I said, I don't know, but let's go. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, for a while, and I don't know how long it was, my, you know, stuff like that, I talked to people about it, you know. Do you and, remember what year that was? Oh, that had to have been uh, early 2000s somewhere. Okay. Okay, so you that know. would have been before these cable shows that came about. Yeah, it, it was before. You know, it was after, you know, the, the Patterson-Gimlin right, oh, yeah. film, yeah. which, by the way, mesmerized me. I was just a little, little adolescent or pre-adolescent. And I remember back then, Mike, looking at it coming out on the local news for the first time, and I clearly remember the hair on the back of my neck standing up because that thing looked real, okay? Looked real to me. And we had, you know, I had spent a lot of time with my, my father, aunts and uncles and stuff out in the woods, and the thought of something like that living out there fascinated me for a while, but growing older, girls, school, college, family, you know, it, it, it oh, oh, fell yeah. in my, you know, fell in my rearview mirror. You know, I, I didn't follow it. But. And, and but, but I, I guess the point I'm making before the cable shows became popular, you go back to finding Bigfoot, Monster Quest, uh, the, those, those programs that started coming out about um, 2010 or so, um, you didn't ha you didn't have the, you know the hey maybe that was Bigfoot, maybe that you know you didn't have that thought process going through your head at that time, um, so I'll let you continue then to kind of tell us kind of what led into that. Well, I I made a, a number of conferences. Uh, man, I poured over the internet once. Once I got, uh, I think what really stirred my interest was at some point surfing the web. I came across a story or a thread that says fishermen attacked at night over in the Possum Kingdom Lake area of Texas. It's west of here, maybe a hundred, hundred and fifty miles uh, uh, around Possum Kingdom Lake, and. I read their story, and the thread was actually a BFRO. It led me to the BFRO website. And uh, I read the story, and, man, there was so much of it. Uh, you know, they, they had stuff thrown at them. And I said, man, this, this is not, you know, uh, uh, coincidence, man. There's something, you know, there, this just isn't mere chance. There's got to be something to this. So I, I very reluctantly, I didn't think I'd get a response uh, 
sent in a sighting report on the BFRO website. And lo and behold, I get a call from a man uh, identifying himself as an investigator. And uh, uh, he explained to me that there had been other fishermen around that lake and waterway uh, that had reported similar activity, which really blew me away. And while I'm talking to him, I heard in the background uh, public safety traffic, sound like law enforcement radio traffic. And I just point blank asked him, I said, are, are you a law enforcement officer? And you know, it was kind of a hesitation. And he said, yeah, he said, I'm calling you from our dispatch room. <laughs> and I said, yeah, I could hear the you know radio traffic in the background. Long story short, uh, he kind of mentored me early. We went out uh, in that area of where I had, uh, uh, you know, this experience. Uh, got another person that was really interested. We went out there uh, back behind where the, the rock throwing uh, incident happened. This kind of low water swampy area. And I'm going to tell you, Mike, it was like immediately we were we, we found this little tree pushed over it, made a crude bridge across the waterway there. And it was like somebody turned on a switch and this foul odor of uh, best way I can describe it is is sewer water, a wet dog and something dead and rotten all mixed into one. I mean, very putrid, eh, you know. And uh, it came on as suddenly as it as it left. When we retreated, it vanished from our, you know, there. Uh, we heard different knocks. We actually put a uh, game cam out and came back and it was gone. Uh, I don't know if somebody happened to cross it or it was taken off, but uh, we moved to another portion of that waterway and uh, I had my very first sighting. Uh, and by the way, Susan, they were white. It was a, a white or gray. I mean, I'm, I was looking at it through binoculars at 150 yards, and uh, the guys with me, uh, or we had split up two and two. There was four of us, and the guy, the experienced guy that was with me, we were kind of facing each other, and I was kind of looking off over his shoulder when I found it. And, of course, he's turning around, where, where, where? And I'm trying to walk. Have you ever tried to walk and look through binoculars at the hey, same time? Yeah. It doesn't work. Doesn't I almost face-planted. And when I got back, you know, got my balance back, uh, the, the subject took off. It, it knew that was the time to move. But the only way, reason or the only way I saw it was it had a, a kind of a receding hair, hairline forehead like mine and the sweat off of its its brow glistened in the sun. You know, I was just scanning the woods and I seen that glint and it was too late in the morning and there hadn't been any dew. And I, I zeroed in on that, that spot where I saw the glint of light. And I really didn't see him at first because he, he was kind of down in the bushes and just his eyes, you know, and a little bit of foliage around him, but I remember the first thing I focused on was his eyes, and he was looking right at me. And of course, a few choice adjectives came out of my mouth, and you know, it was. I thought once I had seen one, my wife, uh, my friends, everybody would believe that, yeah, they really exist. Doesn't happen, folks. You know, I, I got the smiles and the nods, but. No, it, it didn't make it. Yeah, yeah, eye rolls. Yes, you know that that uh, you know they they didn't accept it existed. And for a long time, I tried to prove stuff, Becky and Susan, but that I lost that after the rejections, the jokes, and I just continued uh, serious uh, research on my own and kind of independent. Uh, one of the one of the things I've noticed in this uh, Bigfoot studies and, and different groups, there's a lot of ego and 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 pride and wanting to be the first or the best or have all the answers. And there's a lot of backbiting and, and gossip that shouldn't be. So I, I kind of withdrew from a lot of that. I just I do my own thing and and uh, have a blast doing it. I do go out on uh, uh, BFRO gatherings because there's an excellent bunch of people 
Uh, I've had great time. And I also go out, matter of fact, next month I'll be uh, with uh, Charlie Raymond and the Kentucky Bigfoot Research Organization. We'll be back out in central Kentucky, I guess. They don't, they don't tell us where until a couple weeks before. But I have had uh, amazing stuff happen there. That is uh, the original land of the Cherokees, okay, uh, before the white uh, European settlers drove them out for their own good, you know, and 4,000 of them died. But uh, the Cherokee, one of the stories, Larry Shade, Cherokee storyteller, talks about the elders talking about the Uni Udawahi, okay, loosely translated is forest beings of the lost tribe. They don't equate these subjects to uh, animals, but a clan or a tribe of people. And the the custom there, and it also has flown over, or you know, flowed over into uh, Oklahoma, where the Cherokee land. And I could get into that. That's another story. I won't go there now. But uh, the Cherokee would leave edible roots and berries out around the perimeter of their village, and in turn, the big guys would watch over them over uh, during hunting and gathering endeavors. You know, a symbiote relationship, not not predatory. You know, not conflicting but you know live and let live and scratch each other's backs and of course there's other share the woods pardon me share the woods yes we'll we'll we'll, we'll share it with you share the woods exactly exactly respect courtesy and respect go a long way and i i, I can get into that you yeah. know oh, yeah. but i i when i'm there i'm respectful to them but uh i was i was out in kentucky last year uh, with Charlie Raymond's group, we had walked down a very long one way in, one way out road. You're not going to come in from anywhere else. And we didn't see uh, but one night fisherman about halfway in there. And, and when we got to the end, it was about a mile and a half. They were in there about three quarters of a mile, parked off the, the main road down by the river and had their night light out. And just doing their own thing. We didn't bother them. But we got to the end down there. Uh, this area had had a lot of reported sightings and activity. Uh, I was out there. Uh, we got in a big uh, circle, and one of the people there brought a guitar, did a great uh, singing and playing. You know, he had some Stevie Ray Vaughan, and he did good on the guitar, you know. And uh, the big guys like that kind of stuff. Oh, yeah. Music will draw them in, and we were laughing and just hanging out. We weren't trying to bait, uh, bang, yell, or scream. We just go out there and hang out. And their curiosity is their Achilles heel. You know, you make noise and just camp. They're going to come see what's going on. And I, I could tell you time after time where that has happened. But uh, at some point, I, I was with the group. I got the familiar feeling we're being watched. And sometimes I'm pretty good about knowing the direction. So I kind of eased away from the group while they were still there around the fire. And uh, I scanned this river tree line across a field. And I can't say, you know, to the skeptic, yes undeniably, without a doubt, this was a, a Sasquatch or a Bigfoot. But what I saw, the thermal signature, which we later determined to be 8 to 10 feet tall, was moving kind of back and forth in the tree and foliage line uh, on two legs. It was upright. It wasn't, you know, it, the axis of its body was upright. And they were moving and peaking, and I thought I saw one other one, maybe two, but uh, one of the people there came over and they said, hey, Rick, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm over here watching a big guy. And the, the person goes, really? I said, yeah, he's, he's down there across the field. He said, man, I, have, I, I haven't seen it. I'd love to you know, be able to. I said, hey, I gave him my scope, my thermal, you know, my flare. And I told him where to look, you know, at my 10 o'clock forward stand and look at the 10 o'clock angle. And, uh, he was real quiet. I said, do you see him? And then he goes, yeah. <laughs> he said, he's peeking around a tree looking at us. I said, yep, you've got it. That's him. And he was freaking. Look, folks, that makes my day. Uh, when I can share 
pointing out how elusive, how much they use cover and concealment, but they're there watching. If you know where and how to look, you can you can pick them out fairly good. So he's sitting there watching him, <clears throat> and one of my passions is if the Cherokee had a symbiont relationship with these individuals, very likely they may understand Cherokee. And and my grandmother was fluent. <laughs> You know, yeah, exactly. My my grandmother was fluent. My aunts and uncles were fluent. I know some. Uh, by no means am I fluent, but I can I can converse a, a little bit, you know. And uh, so I told him, I said, "Watch the big guy," and I said, "Tell me if he does anything." And we had heard movement closer to us. We're probably being flanked by a second one at right. least. And I said, watch the big guy. Tell me if he does anything. And I yelled out uh, fairly loudly in, in Cherokee, got the Uste, Dejito. I was asking him, what is your name? And nothing. I said, did he do anything? He said, no, he's still watching. So I said, got the Uste, Dejito. <laughs> you know, what is your name? And the second time, about five seconds after I said that, where we had heard that noise to our right up closer, big, deep bullfrog voice goes, claw, <laughs> which is no, that's no in Cherokee. I got a response that, no, I'm not going to tell you. You know, it wasn't a long sentence, but it was just one very abrupt no, you know. So that was pretty cool. I I, I enjoyed that. Uh, I talked to him. Uh, I've <clears throat> recorded what I think was a female giving a another party uh, a warning. It wasn't in Cherokee, but I believe it was in Choctaw, you know, a native tongue. And by the way, it was in Choctaw Nation territory. Um, it's 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 a passion of mine. Uh, I think I think they know my heart, Mike, Becky, and Susan. I am not there. Uh, to hurt them uh, when that family group or before the family group up in central Oklahoma approached me, uh, I was asked telepathically, um, people asked me to how to, was it English? You know, I, it's hard to explain. It's just a, a clear thought in your mind. I mean, it is crystal clear. It's not you know, something you think you heard. Although when I first heard it in my head, I thought, boy, Rick, you're losing it, man. You're, you're hearing voices in your head, you know, <laughs> but the second time and nobody there knew that I had had being honorably retired law enforcement. I had a, a 45 tucked away on me, you know, okay. Hidden. Okay. okay. I'm going to, I'm going to, I don't want to interrupt, but I want to stop. Go ahead. You, you, you get into that particular incident. I almost think we'll have to. Have, I, I want to do maybe a part two, like a okay, part okay, two on that because okay. because that that one um, we've all read the accounts on that uh, with that central Oklahoma incident. You kind of brought it up, and we're um, <laughs> about the forty three minute mark now. There's oh, a couple man. things. Going to that, that's okay. This time is time flies when you have fun. Yeah. <laughs> And we'll touch on a couple more things and follow up on what we're talking about now. Sure, sure. And then we'll take a, a minute or two break, and then we'll run in, like, like just do a part two, and we'll just talk about that incident in Central Oklahoma, because that's worthy of 30, okay. minutes, 30 minutes in itself, I at least. But you mentioned the Cherokee language, and then Susan's Cherokee. Becky and I have got a trace of Cherokee, and it's not a whole lot. But we had a... Barry Webster on a few weeks ago from the Omaha tribe. And yes. He says they speak Omaha. You you talked about Choctaw. I think they probably, the clans in the areas of the native tribes, I think they probably coexist in language of the of the tribal areas that they were that those clans were in. That that that's kind of what I'm getting at here. But Susan, you care to elaborate on that? Because I know you studied this a lot as well.
it uh, uh, close. <laughs> the accent's a little little different, you know. To to Chilagi, Chilagi, you know, Chilagi is basically how the 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 the, the second words pronounced. And I'm by no ma- a- expert. You're saying it close enough if they they know what you're saying, you know. And I'm not fluent, you know. My my Cherokee probably has a lot of lot of English accent, but Chilagi, you know, is yeah. Oh yeah! Oh yeah! Yes, I. What I have found is there's a lot of uh, researchers that misrepresent themselves. Uh, there's uh, one particular group, you know, that, that claims to want to uh, protect these subjects, and yet for the last eight or ten years, they they've been hell bent on obtaining harvesting a specimen for science okay right i don't buy that uh, i'm sorry uh, i wouldn't bo- i was born in the morning but not yesterday morning i think greed factor fame and fortune is probably the driving factor and you can throw uh, uh, harvesting a specimen for science out the windows and they've been trying for the last eight or ten years Good luck. unsuccessfully but <laughs> There's been a couple instances I know of where they're lucky they didn't shoot another person. Uh, and if they had, uh, they'd have been spending time in the penitentiary, you know, for manslaughter or something. You know, it just, I don't have much patience with that. Uh, I was in an area with my wife, uh, her cousin, and a, a good friend of mine. And that was the only place I was ever growled at. And it shocked me. Now, we weren't attacked, but I was trying to coax a side peeker out from behind a tree so my, the people with me could get a good look. And it growled. <laughs> you know, and it, it, it actually shocked me. And then on the second growl, it was a much more expressive, roar, you know. And, you got and I, just, I just put my hand up and I said, okay, big boy, I can take a hint. We're leaving. It was later I found out that that particular group had taken a shot at one uh, in that lo- general location, not exactly where we were, but they actually found blood. So one of them was wounded by this group. Well, if you seen other hairless clothed ones in the area after that happened, you'd be a little discourteous too. And that's exactly what they wanted me to. That's all that happened was a girl. Well, that's, that's, that's my point, uh, Mike, is if, if they go out and kill one of these subjects, what's the collateral damage to an innocent landowner or hiker or somebody else passing through later, they may not find that person, you know? You know, I've, I've, my son has has hunted. He's since moved to Florida on me, but he's hunted in the conservation area that we research with regularity, and has had interactions with regularity. and And I've instructed, you know, and his, his first attitude was, "Well, I'll blow its head off." I said, "No, you won't." And <laughs> and and it, it it so anyway, he's done that. He did have one incident where. It got aggressive with him and said, don't hunt here. All the other ones, they coexisted just fine. But then that one incident, I was proud of him because he didn't shoot. He just left and and because it did get aggressive with him. But the, the thing is, um, for the most part, they will coexist with the hunters. We see, we witnessed that in our area and, and uh, you witnessed that. But 
I, I want to touch on a couple. Of, I want to touch on one more thing in, here in part one, and then we get it. We'll get into the to the Oklahoma um, experience in part two. Um, but Tom Cantrell is a good friend of the program. He's been on here a few times, and and we read his books and so forth. And you're featured in two of his books, two of his most recent books, um, in a certain section of both those books. The Oklahoma experience is one of them. That'll be coming up here in a little bit. But his latest book that has come out, we had him on a couple of months ago to promote it, called The Proof. You know, The Proof is out there. Um, You're in there in a section talking about a peanut butter jar. There's the book. But hold the book up, Becky. Oh, yeah. Let's watch The Proof. You get TomCantrell.com. You can still get your copies there. He's a wonderful friend. But... I've got a gifting program going on with a friend uh, to the west of me, and we have we include a peanut butter jar with our gifting program, and we make the Sasquatch open the jar up and get his own peanut butter, and he and and, and they do that. They, they, yes, they, they do. They do that. You know, they'll take the lid off the bucket, they'll put the lid back on the bucket, they'll take the lid off the jar, and at times sometimes they leave it all, sometimes they put it back on, but. You and we and we have a picture, a, a sample picture of the peanut butter jar that Sean will stick up here in a little bit as you're talking about it. But you talk about that in the proof as far as their abilities to open a peanut butter jar, get peanut butter, close a peanut butter jar. Elaborate with us about that situation. Uh, I we had visited a uh, full blood Cherokee uh, tribal member out of Jay, Oklahoma, not not in the city, but a rural area outside of there and the locals in that little community called the the subject the howler okay and this particular landowner would put peanut butter along the 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 jar the tree line or fence line of his property and i don't know i didn't get into the details whether he was just yelling it out or he was having a face-to-face encounter. Now I had the howler get very close to me and I've got him on audio uh, just whooping, coming up through a steep ravine. I couldn't get down in there if I wanted to, but he he was relaxed. I guess he knew I was up there and was whooping just to let me record him. I don't know, but it was pretty cool. You know, I got a, I got a thermal of him, but he, he was in cover. It, all you can see is a dot you know, in the foliage, it's not a, not a, I knew where he was, but no, you know, not very uh, detailed, but uh, he would tell the howler, as long as you leave my livestock, my chickens and my dogs alone, I'll leave the peanut butter out there for you. And it worked very well. And his dogs uh, followed me up on a ridge. I was by myself. And when the howler got close, their tails went to wagon and they shot off into the woods they were there for a while, and they came back just as wagging and happy as could be. It was almost like they went and said hi to the yeah, howler I, and then came came back. You I, know? Wit- I witnessed that with a friend's dog that yeah. has befriended, you know, because they'll they'll kill dogs in certain instances. We know. Well, that. yeah, if a dog attacks them, they'll rip but, them but, apart. But I, you know? I, I, I've got a friend whose dog he just sits at the tree line and waits for him to come, and then he goes down and plays. Yep, absolutely. Well, I found one of the jars, took it off the tr- uh, the fence, opened it. Two thirds of the peanut butter was gone. It's got the big thumb and index swirl in it. And I said, "Whoa!" I said, "Here, hold this. You know, let me get a picture of this." You know. Now people said, "Oh, you should have saved it for DNA." Nah, I'm not. You know, that's I'm not. You know. You and I. That's not what. That's not what I'm in it for. No, no. I. Th- matter of fact, they don't want people to know. They don't want a bunch of strangers coming into that area, which right. is why they don't talk about it with outsiders much. They that's trusted me. You know, being a tribal mixed blood tribal member. But that's the same concept that uh, storyteller Larry Shade talks about the Uni Yudawahi. That still works for the Cherokee people, and I'm sure other Native nations with similar. Uh, uh, you know, time there. I'll tell you this much, uh, Mike. People do not realize how accurate these subjects are at tossing objects, okay? I was out with a retired NASA engineer and an active Ponca City police officer, 
and the big guys were showing out. Man, they were throwing stuff. And I told everybody with me, I said, do not move fast in any one direction. Be slow and deliberate because you might walk into something coming in here. <laughs> you know, I mean, something tossed. And, uh, but I actually saw them throw. Uh, that police officer was the most nervous one out of the five of us. And where these objects hit, right behind him, around him, none of it. They weren't messing with anybody but the guy that was the most nervous. And I think they were having a blast out in the woods. Like nobody was hit. But uh, they have fun I'm, with us. Oh, they, they have fun. I was sitting around a campfire with a mixed blood Cherokee and mixed blood Choctaw. The man with us, we had stuff coming in from all different directions. And he was collecting it. You know, he'd get up out of his chair, get away from the fire, and go pick it up and come back. Well, this piece of bark came rolling in from one direction, and they would alternate, keep us guessing where they were. And I got a couple uh, uh, pictures. I call him the fire control officer, one up in the tree watching us, and another side peeker down at another tree. And uh, uh, he got up to go get the bark, and he just out loudly said, can't you guys throw this stuff any closer so I don't have to get up? <laughs> and right after he said that, I was standing behind his folding camp chair, and I heard the distinct thud in the seat of that chair. I've been over and looked down, and there was a quarter-size rock placed right in the seat cushion of that chair. Now, you tell me that isn't accurate. They threw it with enough of an arc that it didn't bounce out. It stayed in the chair. Now, if they can do that, and, and there's a hunter out there that thinks he's going to shoot one, I dare say he's not going to see that 100-mile-an-hour fastball come upside his head. I think they could take the man out with one throw. We, we had that discussion. We, we have, um, and I think we're the first ones that to, to kind of, put two and two together on this research and as some others have talked about it since we came out with it a couple of years ago where we have evidence here in, in southeast Missouri where they hunt with rocks. They'll they'll throw they'll throw rocks perhaps at the deep you know we always see because because in that's a whole other show which we might get to sometime. We have evidence of that. And I was discussing with my partner, but are they can they throw it that hard? Are they that accurate? And and well, you know, think about a major league baseball pitcher can throw 95 to hundred miles an hour and can hit, you know, a dime in that catcher's mitt at, 60, right. at 20 yards at 60 feet. These things are so much bigger, so much stronger, so much more athletic. And if they have all day to practice, how good can they be? <laughs> think about that from, well, from, my, that, I from that respect. I watched a couple of them throwing, and none of us were hit. Uh, I, I was in southern Missouri <clears throat> uh, along uh, a creek. <laughs> I got to be careful for non-disclosure agreements. You know, I don't want to. I don't want to drop anybody off in the grease. But right, right. You know, uh, a creek, and they were about thirty yards from us. So what? you know, maybe, yeah. maybe a hundred feet, right. you know, or, or more. And they were taking broken pieces of shell and I've actually got thermal video. They're, they're chunking it underhand, kind of like a Frisbee. Okay. And at a hundred yards, uh, I thought it when I, I didn't even know it went by me till I was reviewing my video later, thermal video, but this piece of shale comes within about 20 feet of me. And it's not coming down. It's still got a flat trajectory as it goes by me. So you tell me how fast it, it had to be moving from 100 feet away. It yeah. was it was uh, sailing. I, I kind of roughly 19-degree angle. I estimated at least 20 feet. Uh, that thing was going about, about 50 miles an hour past me at 100 yards. So... Uh, could I tell how big it was? I'm not sure, but it was a good sized piece of, of shale and they, they threw it pretty accurate, you know? So pretty impressive. Yeah, it is. It is. I've, I've also got them on video going at uh massive. Well, just an incredible speed. It looks like a uh, 
video on fast forward. It's a blur. They, now, do they move that way all the time? I don't know. Is there a passing gear they can kick in? Who knows? But uh, uh, I, I had one pass by in front of me in my yard, and uh, I've got a – there was odd stuff going on around the house, and they say if you go visit them, they'll come visit you. And my wife's neutral. She's still, you know, she's not a disbeliever, not a believer. She hadn't seen one yet, but there was all kinds of stuff going on around the house. And uh, I put up a 24-7 security system and Motri game cam to supplement over the porch. One juvenile raced by me one night after I was watering the, the trees. Didn't hit me, didn't mess with me. They were just, I guess, saying hello. You know? Now, when you say around the house, we're talking yeah. about a suburban area, right? Well, you yeah, know, you it's really out in the it, middle of nowhere. No, it wasn't that. It was a subdivision. Right. Now, we lived right. in the cul-de-sac of that yeah. subdivision, yeah. but there were schools, roads, apartments. Yeah. Yes, I'm not, ta- I'm not <laughs> talking <laughs> way out in the middle of nowhere, no. You know, so, and, and that's that's you know what I'm getting at. We 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 we've done some work. We had a program recently, Bigfoot in Atlanta, and we're going to go back and revisit that here in the near future. There's some more activity going on there, just right there in the Atlanta suburbs. So that's not out of the question at all. Now, I'm going to go ahead, um, Becky, Susan. If you have anything to ask or add, we're going to go ahead and go, we're going to wrap up this portion of the show, and then we come back. The part two, we're going to hear all about firsthand what happened in Oklahoma that night, because that, I mean, reading it is one thing, hearing it from the horse's mouth is the other. And um, so unless you guys have anything for Rick, we're going to, we're going to take a short break. And then the next program would be part two. We're going to hear all about that. So any final words? Thank you, Rick, for sharing. It You're means. most welcome. You. You're most welcome. I love, folks, I love sharing. I don't care what the skeptic thinks. The One of my passions is showing and sharing. And uh, there's nothing more better. You know, I, I enjoy it. Yeah. You can tell. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you can tell that. Yeah, Sean, you'll be okay if we come back and just do a part two. That'd be all right. About 30 minutes to hear about, you know. Okay, great. So, folks, uh, thanks for tuning in this episode of Understanding Bigfoot. Rick Taylor, Becky Pepper, Susan Perez, Sean Seaball, our producer. Uh, when part two comes out and airs, you're going to want to make that one, too, because Rick will be sharing a very unique experience that happened uh, in Oklahoma with some very special people, and uh, you're not going to want to miss that. So this is Mike Scott, folks. This time, thanks so long and understanding Bigfoot, and we'll see you next time with Rick Taylor and the Oklahoma Experience.